Hello, you're listening to me and Paranormal You with your host, Ryan Singer. Because it's more fun to believe. Very excited today because we've got a great interview headed your way. Um, very excited to talk with Dr. Roger Nelson, uh, who was the coordinator of research at the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory at Princeton. Uh, and has directed the Global Consciousness Project as well since its inception in 1997. So, uh, Doctor, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure, Ryan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Um, well, I mean, I think most of the people who listen to this program, even if even if they're not exactly familiar with the specific details of the Global Consciousness Project, and even even pair as we as I don't know if if it's okay to call the uh, the research lab that, but, um, for sure. short, um, they, they know of these things, I think. And I'm curious, did you ever see the TV show fringe or hear of that show on FX? I think it was like 10 years ago, but I, th- it feels like it had to be loosely based on, on, on pair lab. Um, it was this like Ivy league school that had like an anomalies research laboratory kind of happening, uh, you know, on its campus. Uh, I'm not sure if you if you were familiar with that show or not. Well, that's the that's the pair lab, but um, I I guess it was what's the name of the show? FX. Uh, well, it, the show was called Fringe, and it was uh, on the network FX, and oh. uh, and you know, kind of Fringe stood for like the fringe science that they were kind of experimenting, and they had like a float tank in there, and they were doing like a lot of consciousness uh, and parallel dimension work and, and things like that. Um, but you know, oh, but, I'm sorry, I wasn't there. I mean, a float <laughs> tank's kind of cool, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it really is. It really is. Um, no, I'm um, the Pear Lab had oh. A lot of media coverage, and we were uh, featured in lots of different um, articles and little TV bits and so forth, and the Global Consciousness Project also. So this, it's like 30, 35, 40 years or something, and uh, it was an interesting um, process and an interesting project altogether. So plenty of people came by. I didn't see that one though. Yeah, yeah. The uh, well, it was it was a pretty. I think it was a decently popular show. I, I think it went on for a few years. R- regardless, the uh, it, you know it definitely seems like they took their inspiration from uh, from the real work uh, you you were doing over there. The um, the Global Consciousness Project, you know, it might be a little more for people who aren't like super deep into like knowing about all this kind of stuff or seeking it out. Um, I'm sure they've heard about it. I mean, some of the famous cases are, are like the 9-11, the Princess Diana funeral. And these are where you kind of measure consciousness on, on these. We're having, oh my God. <laughs> They're telling us, uh, we're having a big snowstorm here. Oh, oh. Priority messages from the Princeton police. <laughs> the, so, uh, uh, also the weather, okay, the I weather. That's calm for now. Yeah. Sorry. I always, I always forget out here in California that the, uh, that the winter is still really happening, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty weird, um, thing. We have spring for a little while and then we get snow again. Yeah. So right now they're, I mean, my brother lives in Swarthmore, not far from Philadelphia, and they had trees, uh, many trees down, including some close to his place, which knocked out the power. They've been out of power for five days. Can you imagine that? Oh, wow. Yeah, what do I, the uh, five days is a long time, because I think certain experts would say that, you know, within, uh, like, if, if, like, everybody lost power for two and a half weeks, like uh, you know, across the globe, then that's all all it would really take for everything to kind of just you know quote unquote collapse um, if if nobody had energy or power in that kind of way if like the grid went down. But uh, so five days is like you know oh, one third of the way there. Right, and it's a local sort of thing. And, and but you're right. I'm I'm sure I think about that occasionally because we're always on the edge of doing something disastrous to ourselves and the world. And if we, you know, get into a, a big fat world war, we will knock out power more or less everywhere. And the grid, what internet, you know, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're right. so dependent on things that are fragile. When you say, when you consider the context 
So uh, let's, uh, I'm always hopeful that we will get our act together and become human beings. Yeah, you instead know, of uh, some kind of crazed animals. Yeah, I'm very hopeful of the same thing because I was I was hanging out with a friend of mine just a couple of days ago when we were talking about that, um, the idea of being alive during the World Wars, and like just the effect that has on you know your psyche, like just waking up every day and and knowing like oh the world is at war, and just having that kind of in the back of your mind constantly. It had to be a terrifying time to be alive, to, to just have that just sitting with you, um, constantly. So, I mean, hopefully we can, you know, never have to truly experience that again, but the, uh, I mean, cause the effect, the, the effect that it had, like the events have on our mind and I guess vice versa is what we're kind of, you know, it's kind of the heart of what we're talking about here today. Like the effect our mind can have on the things happening around us in the world is 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 that at the heart of the global consciousness project trying to figure out the effect of consciousness on a, on a mass scale on on things well yes in a way it's it's really aimed at a, a fairly limited uh, question relatively <laughs> uh, to what we might be looking at and we're not uh, what we're looking at is a the possibility that human Consciousness extends out and um, from each of us um, in a kind of unlimited way, and that whereas most of the time it's um, it just interpenetrates. We have fields of consciousness that surround us and extend very far from us. Sometimes the um, inter these the sort of interpenetration becomes an interaction because something synchronizes our emotions or our thoughts and. Things like uh, great terror attacks or um, natural disasters or also great celebrations like New Year's. Those kinds of things synchronize us in such a way that our consciousness fields interact and become what I call a global consciousness. Um, faint, but um, probably uh, real and very important, ultimately, because we need something like a global consciousness However you define that, something you know that kind of takes the whole globe into consideration and inter, interconnects all of us in such a way that we mm, take care of the planet that we're sitting on. It's the only one we've got in spite of uh, science fiction stories. <laughs> yeah, and despite our, our endless search for these uh, sister planets that, you know, life could possibly be sustained on i know people are getting excited about mars myself included but at the same time i mean who wants to live on mars right now i mean you know yeah it's not exactly yeah. a beautiful uh, <laughs> scene <laughs> yeah you don't i mean I, we're spoiled Water. <laughs> yeah yeah we're spoiled out here in california i mean because i could go to the mountains or the beach in the same day and right. uh, and it's like we let's let's try to keep that let's try to keep that going um it is funny because, you know, sometimes when it comes to, you know, I guess mainstream acceptance uh, of what the news wants to talk about or even of what like people who just fancy themselves like armchair skeptics sitting at home, um, whether they want to, you know, consider themselves an autodidact or not, they, you know, uh, so when it comes to like pushing the limits of, you know, experimentation and, and trying to understand consciousness, um, some people will be like, well, let's hold, let's hold, let's hold up, let's hold up here. But at the same time, these, a lot of this stuff, it's, it's like, we're talking about trying to be connected. We're talking about, you know, the importance of coming together. Like there's not, it's not like this has like the implications of, you know, there's no conspiracy theories, like all these people in the global uh, consciousness or who believe in the connected connectivity of one they just want to enslave everybody no it's it's typically the opposite of of things like that which i find interesting on the pushback um do you find when you get or if you even do get pushback i'm not even you know 100 percent sure um what is like the main thing people you know might push back upon when it comes to trying to talk about this stuff well, I, the truth is, um, I don't get very much educated pushback. I, I get quite a few uh, skeptics who say that's impossible, but it, uh, they don't do their homework. And I'd rather talk to somebody who says, I don't understand how that might be possible. Uh, can we talk about it? And uh, 
you know, you can raise questions and we can do our best. Those of us who do this kind of research, we can do our best to answer those questions. But if you run up against a blank uh, stare, you know, somebody says, oh, that I don't believe anything at all. <laughs> the consciousness, what you're talking about, <laughs> uh, emanations from three pounds of meat inside the skull. And uh, they don't extend more than about, you know, two centimeters from the skull and on and on. There, There's, in other words, a kind of physicalist interpretation of the world, which is very strong and it's very powerful because it's effective. Um, and, the, and people are, I think, half educated um, or maybe even what you might call well-educated are convinced that that's all there is. They don't really pay much attention to the question of consciousness or mind. What is consciousness? Is it something that is made out of, uh, you know, particles and fast moving uh, uh, electromagnetic fields? Or is it something maybe a bit more ethereal? Where does creativity arise? You know, what is a, a poem made of? How do we understand beauty? Those kinds of things just don't fit into the physical interpretations that most people prefer um, as a result of the education that we get in the West anyway. If you go to the East, uh, go to Japan or China, um, India, you'll find people are vastly more open. Even the scientific, uh, highly educated scientific people are, um, are, are differently oriented when it comes to things like what is consciousness, what is mind, what difference does it make if somebody prays or um, imagines a better future? That people uh, in this country, um, that is in the West, um, by and large, are oriented so strongly to the mechanical materialist perspective that it's very hard for them to think about something like consciousness. I don't know if that's answering the question about skepticism. No, I think it is. I think I think uh, I, th I think we're definitely covering. Uh, yeah, my I and I don't know if you have an answer to. To this question, and I don't necessarily expect you to, but it's something I think about constantly. Um, and the fact that I'm even thinking about it kind of like trips me out a little bit, um, like thinking about how I'm even thinking about it. But the um, when it comes to like the origins of consciousness, do you have do you have any ideas or like you know what do you think? Where do you think this all kind of stems from? Do you do you have any kind of theories of your own or? Are you talking about what is consciousness? Yeah, like, like, what do you think? Like, as far as when it when it comes to how, how we have this ability to be con be aware of ourselves and then have this creativity, do you think it comes from somewhere? Or do you think it's just like a part of the evolutionary process? Yeah, it's a it's a question that nobody has any um, you know widely accepted answer to. Uh, what I don't think is that consciousness is just a um, you know, a little bit of frisson from uh, brain cells bashing against each other, <laughs> chemicals into the synapses and stuff like that. Consciousness is a bit, I mean, more um, amazing than that. And I'm somewhere in between the people who are materialists, and, which I've just been describing, and the other end of a kind of spectrum of thought about consciousness, which is says that consciousness is fundamental that it's the beginning point. It's not the end, it's the beginning. That is, the entire universe is consciousness, and um, out of that uh, incredibly universal, uh, un unlimited consciousness arises something that um, is a little more mm, uh, limited in scope, which uh, can be the consciousness of a planetary system, maybe the consciousness of a planet or the consciousness of a human being. Uh, the, and that's, that form of um, uh, explanation or description of consciousness is very appealing in a certain way, but I don't think it answers all the questions very well either. Like, for example, why, what, um, how does a consciousness that feels um, to me and to you and every listener you have how does a consciousness that feels like an individual separated kind of thing arise out of something so universal? Why doesn't, why don't we automatically um, act 
and perceive as if we were part of a universal consciousness. Mm, it's easy enough to write poetry about that, but we haven't got the ourselves uh, far enough along in thinking about these things to write the equations, um, which will, you know, allow the scientific method, namely, to do some kind of an experiment to test a hypothesis that will teach us yes or no about a certain um, picture of how things work. So back to what I think consciousness is, I think it's, um, it, it's very much a kind of um, separated um, entity in, from the physical m body, but one which is fully and uh, very um, consequentially interacting with the physical matrix all the time. As in other words, the, the brain, it's not useless. It's a, a kind of, um, you know, waypoint. It's a place where consciousness thrives and um, has it, uh, profoundly important effects in uh, keeping the body running nicely and uh, getting the body <laughs> up in the morning and ready to go and, and so on. And at the same time, consciousness is out in the world, uh, touching um, the leaves on the trees. Well, in California, here we don't have leaves yet. <laughs> Soon enough, hopefully. Very beautiful snowfall at the moment. And my mind, you know, my consciousness, my mind is reaching out and becoming one with those snowflakes as they're falling or the flowers when they're blooming and that, and that sort of thing. Um, my consciousness is not something that just uh, lives inside my skull, but it exists in a lar much larger world and actually touches that world and touches other consciousness in some way that we can actually show in, uh, in research, in reasonably good experiments when they're designed to ask questions about that. So I think that I, for just to <laughs> put it very straightforwardly, my consciousness and yours is something that ex exists in a much larger world than we are inclined to think. And I, I think we ought to learn more about that, take advantage of it, um, become more responsible for hosting or being part of such a consciousness. Yeah, and it really speaks to the idea of, you know, joining forces with other people and like the, the power in numbers when it comes to you know, utilizing these, I mean, these, I mean, these real gifts that we have, I mean, it seems like, and like when you talked about like the scope, the scale of, you know, between the mechanical and like, you know, the poetic almost, and like where consciousness was the beginning of it all, it really, you know, strikes me as like, you know, when you talk about hermeticism, um, you know, where it's like, all, you know, all is mental is like one of the fundamental aspects of, of hermetics. Um, talking about creation and everything. So I guess somewhere in the middle there, too, is probably kind of where I fall as well. But, like, there is something very poetic about um, understanding, you know, the biggerness or, or the bigness of our consciousness and the way it does actually interact physically with, with the world outside of just, you know, these these physical bodies we have. And I think that's kind of... One of, well, there, I mean, there's a lot going on with the Global Consciousness Project that I think is very fascinating. But, you know, that's one of the things when it comes to, you know, being able to connect with people separate from you um, in the way that we see ourselves separate from every other person, right, uh, physically. Um, but if we view this consciousness in the way that you're, you're laying it out for us, there's, you know, the interconnect, the overlap as your, or the intersection of our consciousnesses. So we all do become together in that way. And when, or, or go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to say, right. <laughs> and we have uh, really interesting kinds of experiments that show when a group, for example, you got maybe, I don't know if you do, uh, you know, work with, uh, you know, on stage with an audience of uh, maybe 100 or 200 or 300 people. But if you do, you I mean, anybody who does uh, comes to various points in time when that audience is all integrated and integrated with you at, who are on the stage. 
In other words, everything becomes coherent. If we put one of our random number generator devices recording continuous streams of random data in such a situation, what normally is random becomes very slightly ordered. It becomes slightly structured. And I think that is, a, I mean, it's there. we've done the experiments in such a way that we, the only reasonable explanation for that ordering of what's supposed to be random is the consciousness, a group consciousness where coherence arises out of whatever is going on. We do rituals, we do um, concerts, we do all kinds of things that create situations where people come together in a kind of group that is um, that it then in, um, that produces something which I call a group consciousness, and that um, group consciousness exists in its own right and it has the capacity. Uh, like an individual consciousness does to extend out into the world and impose its coherence on a system like our labile random number generators, which um, then become slightly less random. In other words, they become very slightly, they are, they are inclined to become coherent just because there's structured inform or information present. So, I mean, going on to a kind of implication from that, if that happens with something as, you know, abstract and, and um, non-lively, you might say, unliving, like a random number generator, think what it might um, do also to a person. If, if you got somebody in the midst of a bunch of healers and all of the healers focus their attention on healing this person who's wounded or or um, ill somehow, that person is going to feel it. And uh, we have also not, I haven't personally been involved in it, but healing research shows that this kind of uh, wish for order or an increase in health on the part of somebody who needs that actually has some effects on it. So I guess the point I want to make is that both as individuals and as groups, what we intend and wish for has uh, some effect, real effects in the world. They aren't big, uh, but on the other hand, they're uh, surprisingly important. If we think about the imp implications of this kind of thing happening at all, it, um, it suggests that we should pay close attention and learn more about it to the point where we actually can use these uh, special capacities that most of us are a little surprised by, about um, to very good effect. Yeah, it's, it's all very fascinating because, I mean, ever since I was a kid, in some aspects I feel like science kind of catches up with, I don't know, the intuitive knowledge that maybe we've just kind of been born with or that, that we seem to have, whether it's esoteric or, you know, or ancient or, or whatever we want to label it as. You know, my I remember being a kid and my grandma telling me, uh, you know, well, if we, if, you know, the Bible says if, you know, more than 10 people are together for a prayer, you know, it's more powerful or, you know, so there's these things in different religions where there's strength in numbers, uh, right. <laughs> for sure. When it comes to focusing our thoughts and, and, oh, for sure. Like performing, if there's a crowd that gets, you know, if there's like a hundred or 200 people in a room and they all kind of sync together there's something really magical that happens on a performance and i think everybody's familiar with the idea of you know you have to give me you know give energy to get energy in a certain way when it comes to performances and even like just in simple interactions with people if if you're engaged there's a juice there there's something really there's like an electricity to the interaction and We've all walked into a room at a party where maybe somebody, maybe a couple just had a fight and, and we all, and we walk into the room and we're like, Ooh, something, something's, oh, going, yeah. on. something's <laughs> going on in here. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you could. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I love the, the language. It's juice yeah, yeah. and <laughs> electricity and so on. My language is so, uh, so scientifically, oh, I guess kind of clumsy in a way. We talk or, about or educated or educated, you could say. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but I mean, what we're trying to do is to uh, develop ways, um, systems which are technical or technological in nature, but which can capture a little of that juice. 
I really think, you know, <laughs> we have, we've been doing that for some years now. And uh, it, by, at this point, it seems really important for, it to, for it, you know, you mentioned your grandmother and prayer and if 10 come together and so forth. If you think about it, prayer has probably been with us since we could speak or since we could think at all, since human beings from the earliest days of human beings as, co as cognizant, cognizing beings, we've done something like prayer. And at the same time, I think everybody knows that we're reasonably practical and we don't just keep on doing things that are waste, a waste of time uh, or uh, foolish. <laughs> so we, in other words, we sort things and we stop doing stuff sometimes very slowly and too slowly, and we uh, stop doing things which are useless uh, or destructive, and we keep on doing things that, are, that have some uh, value. So prayer is one of those that has value, apparently, because it's been around for many thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, and, and we keep on doing it. Even though, especially in the modern Western world, as I was talking about earlier, um, a lot of people say, ah, that's, that's all just hogwash. It's not hogwash. We are doing something that human beings have learned to do, just like um, animals learn not to eat certain foods because they're poisonous or to choose other ones because they're especially nutritious. We choose prayer because it's nutritious. Yeah, there is there is something to be... I've never thought of that. I mean, there's something to be said about, you know, like over time, anything useless does get phased out uh, eventually. So there must be there must be something to it. The I also wonder, like I've been thinking about this a lot and I think it ties in when, you know, when it comes to. I don't know, like uh, memory, human memory uh, collectively, um, like there's just certain things that maybe we're born knowing the same way. Like if someone watches the planet earth, uh, and you know, you see the lizard hatch from a shell underneath the sand and it instinctually knows to run to the beach, um, through like a maze of snakes that it knows it has to stay away from, even though it's never seen a snake before. Um, like these instincts that we have as animals. I mean, people talk about the, you know, the march of the penguins or, or all those, those kind of things. But human beings also have to have those in some way. I mean, considering we're animals. Do you think that ties into like our ability to like tap into our consciousness or our, con I mean, this is kind of a, this is a, a pretty broad, uh, winding question actually. Uh, so hmm. I, I, so I, my apologies if it's a little bit confusing, but, uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> then, you know, the, the result will be a, a, a long winded wind <laughs> winding down the road sort of answer. Well, nope. that, well, that'd be great because uh, the people who listen to this program, uh, you know, they've heard me, you know, long enough. So let's, you know, so it's nice to get some other voices in here. So we have, you know, possibly we have these human memories, and Joseph Campbell talks about like the hero's journey, the myth that, like, the monomyth, and like how we've all, like, all humans since the beginning of, you know, kind of even consciousness, have had these stories that resonate. This story that resonates with all of us. Um, when it comes to the the idea of really understanding our effect uh, or our consciousness's effect on our surroundings and everything else. Do you think that's like the next step um, in kind of our, just our general awareness when it comes to, uh, you know, moving forward in a major way as, as like a, as a species? Well, uh, yeah, yes. I mean, I'm not quite sure where we are in the winding path, but um, I think that Tehar de Chardin's idea of a, a noosphere, um, and if you haven't heard of that, it's worth looking up this guy um, who was a Jesuit priest and a paleontologist. So he was a scientific guy and a, a theologian at the same time. And he wrote about um, evolution. He wrote one book called The Phenomenon of Man in French, but it's the English title, The Phenomenon of Man, another one called The Future of Man. And basically he was talking about, um, you know, you start with uh, what appears to be dead particles, and but they, com they eventually bump into each other and combine and become uh, more complicated. And eventually those become living particles and, and in turn uh, gather together to become 
uh, very small uh, creatures which are living and they, you know, the process goes on until you get to human beings. And he said, we have come to believe that we are the pinnacle of evolution. He says, but it isn't so. There is still another stage and that stage is to become a sheath of intelligence for the earth. And he called that a noosphere, a, sp a sphere of no knowing or knowledge or intelligence that's uh, kind of, in a sense, analogous to a, a, um, an atmosphere or an ionosphere and so forth. This one is, um, uh, is the knowing that means a consciousness that, that uh, takes responsibility for the earth that it uh, covers. So that, he says, is the next stage of human evolution. And I think we are started on that path, but we are very, very far from, um, you know, recognizing, uh, first of all, that is the path that we should be on. And, um, and secondly, and more importantly, very far from cooperatively engaging in what we could be doing, um, namely a kind of conscious evolution. We actually have the capacity, and I think anybody who considers um, for more than a, um, a brief moment what it means to be conscious and what it means to evolve, I think anybody who puts those kinds of things together will realize that we have, in all, all of us right now, the possibility to engage in conscious evolution. That's what consciousness is for, in a way, is to get, is to, you know, move on to its more developed and more complete, more human uh, phase. In other words, to live up to our potential. So I've been uh, going on for a bit. <laughs> now it's your turn again. <laughs> well, I was, um, I was curious, when it comes to the noosphere, does that have a tie-in to, like, noetic sciences? Uh, yes, it does. You know, I've... I mean, uh, the noetic sciences are, you know, that's a name for a very broad s uh, spectrum. Uh, one of the places I associate with a lot is um, the Institute for Noetic Sciences. But noetic uh, in general just refers to this idea that it is possible to know things and to work, um, to live in the world uh, from the point of view of noetics, uh, from knowledge and uh, the application of knowing. So... So what happened in young Roger's life where you're, <laughs> where you're like, I am going to, I'm going to explore some stuff. I like, like where on are did you just always kind of have it in you? Was that, that just who you were when, uh, when you were a kid where you're like, I want to understand like, uh, knowing and science. Yeah. yeah it's a good, that's a uh, nice question. I mean, not, I'm, like most people, uh, not able to remember things actually as they were. I remember them as I think they were. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was, I called myself uh, and I recognized myself as a curious kid, maybe in more ways than one. But um, so I was, uh, I, uh, I, at one point, I, this I remember very clearly. I wanted to um, learn about judo. I had heard about judo, this fantastic martial arts form. And um, I lived in a little city. It was actually the third largest city in Nebraska, but that didn't mean it was very big. 15,000 people. There were no uh, judo teachers or jujitsu or any, anything else like martial arts. No yoga, no nothing in North Platte, Nebraska. But there was a library, a wonderful um, opportunity for a curious kid. So I went to the library looking for instruction manuals on uh, martial arts. And what I found was yoga. I found this marvelous yoga book, which was written by a German and an Indian together. And um, I learned some, you know, I learned how to do Hatha yoga. And I learned what meditation was in a very general sense. And that kind of set me on a path um, where I became not less but more curious. I came across also a book about parapsychology written by J.B. Ryan, who was the guy that set up the first real experimental uh, parapsychology laboratory in 
uh, Duke University in the 1930s, I guess, or 40s. And that book had uh, cl careful, clear descriptions of experiments they did. And I uh, and organized some of, a bunch of my friends to do um, these kinds of experiments. And we did. So as high school kids, young uh, teenagers or mid-teenagers. And what we um, accomplished was a, a real lesson for me. It was we um, did these experiments as as um, as carefully as possible and and quite well, I think. And then we we got results that said yes, it is possible to guess more cards more likely than you ought to be able to by chance, or you know, to throw dice and get more ones than you ought to by chance, and things like that. Only it wasn't miraculous. There weren't, um, you know, such powerful results that we knew that we could suddenly go to break the bank in Las Vegas. Instead, <laughs> it was just the right sort of thing to inspire a scientific understanding. This is like a scientific experiment. It shows a little tendency that shouldn't happen by chance, but it is, it's not an accident. It's not something that is, um, you know, completely out of this world. So it set me on a path of being open-minded about possibilities that are excluded from our physical models and so on. So anyway, that I, I, that was uh, the earliest part of my uh, stuff. And then many years later, I uh, was teaching psychology, including experimental psychology in a small college in Vermont. And uh, the, I wanted people to do experiments because that's how you learn by doing. And uh, turned, I said, you know, pick something that's really interesting. And the two things that really turned out to be especially interesting to people were um, uh, marijuana experiments. What does that do to you? And the other, the other one was illegal, so we didn't do too many of those. The other one was uh, parapsychology, telepathy and psychokinesis. And I said, you bet. Uh, we'll do high quality experiments and uh, see what we learn from. The story goes on very just uh, briefly to get uh, at some point after, for various reasons, I was kind of interested in going off to some other kind of work. And I loved the idea of research, which you can do at a big university, but you can't really do much at um, a college. So um, a friend of mine gave me a chronicle of higher education. I had one ad, <laughs> next to one that he had circled that he thought I'd be interested in. The one uh, adjacent to that said, um, they're looking for a cognitive psychologist interested in the lesser known aspects of perception in at Princeton University in the engineering school. So I thought, well, that, what are they gonna do? Uh, old faction or something like that. And so I contacted them and turned out they, what they wanted to do was mind machine interaction experiments. <laughs> So I was on my way back to the early days of my interest in these kinds of things. Uh, Princeton's a beautiful um, place to do research of any kind, even though it, uh, as a university, as a kind of university community, wasn't terribly friendly to the idea of doing what amounted to psychic research. Mm, we um, put together uh, a lab in the engineering school started by the dean of the School of Engineering, um, which was dedicated to doing high quality, high tech science, um, asking questions about consciousness. So, and we did that for a long time, many, two, I've, I was there for 22 years before I retired and started doing the Con Global Consciousness Project full time. And the lab um, was open for 27 years. And in that period of time, we produced a tremendous amount of high quality scientific evidence that consciousness is not stuck in your head, but it reaches out and, and um, you know, changes the way the uh, physical world is. Yeah, I feel like there could be an entire Ken Burns documentary series on on pair on, on, on all the work that was going there for, for those, you know, two plus decades. The, uh, the I wonder, I guess, uh, uh, was there a bunch of documentaries that came through while you were, while you were working there? 
every now and then somebody would do a documentary. I think the first one that uh, really impressed me was a a guy from uh, England. His name was Tony Edwards. He was a producer of a show that a series that was about iconoclastic scientists and Bob John qualified and the pair lab uh, as a, you know, a, a place of work uh, qualified perfectly for this, uh, you know, the kind of divergence from the mainstream path that Tony Edwards was interested in. Be he did a beautiful uh, documentary, probably in the already in the mid 80s. And then since then, there have been quite a quite a few uh, other ones. Um, in many cases, the pair was part of, a, um, you know, a number of things that people wanted to, um, you know, to talk about in a documentary. The same thing is true of, um, of the GCP. We've been part of quite a number of documentaries and ranging from, uh, you know, uh, small production companies to uh, kind of uh, big hotshot organizations like uh, Discovery Science Channel, which was doing for a few years um, this thing with Morgan Freeman as the narrator. Enter the for, wormhole, right? The wormhole, uh, yeah. yeah. So um, GCP was, um, Global Consciousness Project, was part of, of uh, number six in the series, and which was about the sixth sense. And uh, so, you know, we've been on TV here and there and quite frequently. Yeah. And just so people are aware, I mean, the Global Consciousness Project is is ongoing, um, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, currently, as as we're talking. And let's I guess we can kind of give a, a brief overview to to some people. I think um, generally a lot of people who listen to this podcast kind of are, are you know, it's very likely that they're already very into this, but, um, and if, and if they haven't heard of it, they definitely are into the, the concepts because it strikes me too, as like a scientist, when you're talking about like the iconoclast, it's like, if you're, and maybe it's my personality as well, wherever it came from, uh, also kind of a curious kid, but like to get into science, it's like, you know, I'd, I'd want to like be out there on the, on the, you know, pushing it, uh, the divergent path, you know, trying to discover the new stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> it would seem, it would seem like that's where the excitement or the juice is, uh, when it comes to, you know, doing the work. But, um, the, uh, GCP is, uh, I, I can't remember the exact number, so forgive me, but I know it's over a hundred different locations on the, on the planet right now. Right. Well, it's um, the n number of active nodes uh, varies over time, but there's probably I think more than a hundred locations have had a one of the GCP nodes. Um, at the peak, there were about seventy of them active, seventy, seventy-three, something like that, active at one time. But people, you know, um, whole I guess we call it hosting. <laughs> We, people will host an egg site. Um, the device uh, re, we refer to as an egg, <laughs> which comes from uh, e -E, e -E -G. I mean, it comes from EGG, which is electrogiogram, which is a kind of play on electroencephalogram or EEG. So we have an EEG for the Earth, which is an egg, um, an electrogiogram. So we call all these devices eggs. Anyway, the egg hosts... Um, can, you know, sometimes they have to quit for whatever reason. Um, it's been such a long running project that we now have uh, lost eggs at least three, four times, five or six times, uh, because people died, you know, they, they, they ran it while they were living and then they went on to different occupations or, yeah. Uh, and most of this is uh, volunteer. It's like these are volunteers, correct? Uh, right. Who who take part in the project? I mean, just so people are clear that this isn't some kind of like, hey, you know, money making. Like, oh, I'll get into being an egg host. You know, make some money. Like this is <laughs> no, this no. Is, yeah, this is about <laughs> the research. contrary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think most people who are egg hosts, uh, you know, they spend they spend money on their broadband internet connection. 
I provide all the techno, you know, the uh, gadgetry and software and stuff like that. So it doesn't really cost them much out of pocket. But if they, um, you know, most uh, most people have an inter internet connection anyway. But you could say that they're spending some of their money on on that. Yeah, and so it's like all around the world, and so what. It's very fascinating. If you go to the website, um, you have the actual visual, uh, visual evidence, if you, or you know, representations of this phenomenon of what happens during these events. So people can see the charts. They can see the visual representations of the work in actual action, and it and it's it's pretty it's pretty cool stuff. Um, to be able to see now, do you have someone? Are you running the website too, or do you have somebody helping you out with that? Or is there a? Um, I'm just wondering because if people wanted to reach out to you, I don't want you know you to get necessarily flooded. But um. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm may the person to contact, um, but uh, by no means am I the only person involved. I, the website was was originally designed and and I, I did it myself. But a very crude sort of thing, and then, you know, at the very beginning, <clears throat> and then a friend of mine who is uh, in much better at that kind of thing built a um, an, a high quality website, and um, I think that it got went through another revision or two, and then finally uh, I got an, an emails from somebody uh, whom I didn't know who was saying, you know, you really ought to have this <clears throat> your um, um, results page and set up so, so that people could sort it how they want to. And I said, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> but it turned out that she's, that this woman was an absolutely, she is an absolutely incredibly gifted um, um, website programmer. She's actually a, a, a lawyer who does security stuff, but incredibly good. So she rebuilt um things in a fashion that's, that allows people to actually look at it on not just uh, computer screens, but even on mobile devices, I think. I, I haven't used that very much myself. And uh, those things like allow you to sort the, um, the, the 500 events by date or by name or by the size of the Z-score and things like that. So, and, and I have so many uh, other people like her who have gifted me with the time the time and really high level skills to build for example those kinds of device those uh displays that show for example the dot uh that's what it's called the gcp dot shows um a, a kind of uh almost three-dimensional looking uh, dot of color which changes depending on how coherent the data are coming in from the outlying stations and it's pretty much real time it's about maybe five between five and ten minutes late because it takes that much time to get all the data in and do the processing so but the point i want to make is that um this project the gcp is a, a result of an amazing amount of uh, time and energy from really gifted people who are just willing to donate their time Right now, I need, and actually I have an offer in my email queue from somebody who I think probably could can do this. Uh, one of the displays needs to be converted from Java to um, HTML5 and uh, because the, almost nobody can, can use that display because Java is insecure according to the web browsers. Anyway. I'm yeah. going on yeah. great yeah. length about things that nobody's interested in, except me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I, when it comes to being able to, and it's one thing to be able to do the work, I mean, which you've been doing for years. It's another thing to, you know, you want to get the work out there. So, I mean, it is a, a, an important aspect of, of the process, I think. So, like something that seems maybe as, you know, you know, boring to other people is like being able to convert Java to HTML. That's like an important, you know, step in the process of the dissemination of information, which then, you know, would open maybe someone's mind to the idea that this global consciousness thing is real, therefore affects 
So I, I, I don't think it's, uh, you know, so I do think it's important. I, I am curious on maybe one of the aha moments that you've had, because I'm sure you've had them, you know, throughout your life. And it sounds like, you know, experimenting with your friends as teenagers um, with the dice and the cards was maybe kind of the first aha moment uh, on your journey uh, after reading these books. But like when it came to like, you know, Pear Lab or even with GCP, do you remember like like one of the real big aha moments where you're like, wow, this I'm going to have to keep doing this because there's something really going on here. Right. You know, I it's a it's a very interesting question for me to think about. And one response that comes to mind is that I have been living in a persistent aha moment. Oh, wow, <laughs> it's yeah. like, uh, yeah, I mean, really, I uh, I can tell um, about periods of time, like, for example, when I um, went to a retreat, we had, um, at this time in the Pear Lab, we had uh, finally succeeded in something I wanted to do from the time I got there before, from before I got there, which is to run continuous uh, data, record, re- record the data continuously so we can do things like um, impose an intention on it and see if it changes. And... Um, and this allowed us to do remote random event generator or random number generator experiments. So I um, now was we were in a position to do that by allowing people in a remote location to say to to decide for themselves the order in which uh, the data should change to high or low or uh, baseline levels. And um, I went to a re- retreat with a Vietnamese monk named Thich Nhat Hanh, along with 600 other people. And I was sitting in the uh, a huge uh, tent with these, you know, 600 people um, waiting for Thich Nhat Hanh to come in and give a Dharma talk. And while during the at the beginning of the Dharma talk, I said, mm, I think I will do uh, for this upcoming uh, session the order high baseline low. And then the next day, for in another Dharma talk, I would decide again my the order of my intentions. And after several days, um, meanwhile, the people um, in Princeton knew at what time I was supposed to be um, thinking about the random number generator. And so they ran the data and marked the uh, beginning of uh, three periods of data, which would later get labels from when I reported my intentions. And it turned out that my intentions um, matched the outcome um, almost impeccably, almost all. (laughs) I mean, I might have missed one or two times out of uh, 15 such sessions, which was a record um, that I, I mean, it was a positive uh, effect of my uh, attempts to inter interact with this machine, unlike anything I'd experienced before. Mostly, I just had blah results. Nothing much happened, right? <laughs> My eyes went low sometimes or didn't do anything other times and, and so forth. So this was a bit of a revelation. That kind of an epiphany because it made me um, aware of something like, not only is it possible to do things like remote, and by the way, they were also off time. I did my thinking at the at time of the Dharma talk and uh, the people, uh, the uh, time for the um, uh, data to be recorded was some other time. And uh, so I knew that not only can you do it from a remote location, but you can do it from a remote time relatively. And finally, the effect, at least the idea came to mind, came to me that uh, the harder it is, the e- the more likely you will get good results. Why? Because it's impossible. So why is why not just make it completely impossible? So I don't know. That was that was a, a very nice kind of experience. There is um, an, another major epiphany uh, sort of moment or aha moment was when uh, the 9/11 uh, terrorist attacks happened. That was that was fantastically engaging over a period of quite a few days. I didn't even, I had no idea what was happening. Uh, I heard about 
a plane crashing to the trade towers and I thought on the radio and I thought oh some poor guy uh, flying his Cessna lost track of what he was doing and <laughs> crashed into the building but it wasn't that of course as it turns out among other things that the effects in our data lasted for m probably more than three days and also seemed to start some several hours before the first plane hit so these are kind of, these are facts, if you will, or at least they're evidence in the data for something that we shouldn't or didn't necessarily expect. So and it it really not only caused a lot of you know tragic feelings of compassion and and um, sadness and all that kind of stuff, but also just really enlightened those of us who were working on this project to how many questions we still had to answer. Yeah, because the idea of this starting, you know, before the events even happen, you know, really gets into the idea of time, you know, as, as like the linear nature of time and like the the idea of intuition and, you know, foresight and kind of knowing in advance almost the uh, right. with with our higher whether we want to call it our higher self or our, 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 our consciousness um, there becomes the implications of like this work are you know it's so fun to think about and <clears throat> and just kind of let your mind kind of go go wild with what the mind could do when it comes to I do wonder if you ever think about the implications with because when it comes to the, you know, our thoughts affecting, let's say, physical, you know, you know, mechanical objects um, with the with, you know, the the constant talk of, you know, singularity, uh, the, the melting of human and machine together, it would seem to be, I don't know. I mean, we've had that for a long time with iron lungs or, you know, even heart pumps and things like that. So we've been doing mechanical humans for a while, but it seems like it 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 removes roadblocks into integration. But I wonder uh, what your thoughts on on like that future uh, when it comes to the power of thought being integrated with machines. Well, I think there's a lot of progress uh, being made and, and lots of aspirations in terms of uh, melding um, the, you know, something like the brain or maybe consciousness with with uh, artificial intelligence. And you know, there are plenty of people uh, who are, you know, have committed their lives and fortunes, as it were, to um, that task. I don't I don't. Uh, at this point, see mm, that as being, um, you know, m very much influenced by, or, you know, I don't see much uh, collaborative, uh, collaborative effort <laughs> with the with the kind of things that we do did in, in the pair lab or in sci research in general. But it it very well could happen. Um, the, the reason I am dubious about it is that the effects that we see are small. And they're statistical in nature. And people who are doing, you know, going to wire up a uh, an electrode into a brain cell are not going to want to be doing probabilistic things. I don't think. I mean, I, if somebody wanted to put an electrode in my head, I'd rather it be completely controlled by a very highly skilled artificial intelligence uh, rather than uh, dependent on maybe uh, this time or maybe next time, which is the way statistical stuff goes. I'm not sure, you know, uh, whether that. I'm I'm a little bit um, skeptical about the, um, you know, anytime soon kind of merging of human and artificial intelligence. But uh, I got I have friends and colleagues, and I know about other people who are working away mightily, and they expect it sooner. You know, they expect it within twenty years. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating that the early estimates uh, that are out there. I mean, I think in the meantime, I we could do ourselves a favor and kind of <laughs> focus on, you know, you know, moving ourselves along as we are already, 
uh, when it comes to, you know, protecting, uh, you know, the environment, uh, understanding our connectedness to one another and, and just trying to understand ourselves before we try to build different versions of ourselves. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And, I'm, and it doesn't mean I, and I doubt this is true for you either, that I, we, we don't want to shut down research or say the only thing to do is what we think is the right thing to do. Yeah, for sure. But it's just that we shouldn't, I think, probably you know, put too many eggs in that basket. And you're so right that we have other very, very important kinds of things that we should be doing and, and spending our creative energies on. And uh, most, um, most prominent among those are, are things like you mentioned. We don't understand ourselves as human beings very well. And so we're not doing a very good job of being human beings, uh, alas. And the result of that is pain. We, the result is pain and misery all over the world. You know, much earlier, um, you were talking about how uh, during, you know, if, if we were in a world war, we would experience something, you know, fantastically different and horrifying. And the truth is that there are people in the Middle East and various countries around the world in Africa who are experiencing that daily. And we ought to, as human beings, be able to see that that's wrong. That is not the way human beings should behave and do something about it. And I, so I'm afraid I, I don't want to get into the political too much, but uh, it, that the combination of uh, politics and scientific understanding or it should be uh, something that could create a, a better path forward. We, but we're not um, paying attention to that uh, so far. So in fact, I think a lot of politicians are deadly opposed to science because I'm afraid they know <clears throat> they wouldn't be able to do what they want to do in service of their own personal needs and greeds um, if science were given a you know, fair opportunity to speak. Yeah, there's definitely the uh, the financial funding of, you know, of their, I don't know, their safety or not their their job security, I should say, uh, would definitely, they'd, they'd be putting that at stake, which is, you know, which is unfortunate, um, you know, t to think that, uh, you know, I don't know, it's it, that old adage always stuck with me really well ever since a kid, like you can't take it with you after you're gone when it, oh, comes, yeah. when it comes to this, you know, the money and the physical things. And it's just like, what do we, you know, I don't know. I like to ask myself, like, what am I doing here? Uh, you know, uh -huh. like what, what, like, I mean, what am I really doing here? Uh, you know, if I'm not trying to like figure out, you know, how to become something more, maybe uh, and sure we're all people and we all get hungry and tired and have other things going on. But yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating. I do like thinking about the future and like, especially in concerns with, uh, or, you know, in regards to like the work that you've been doing for, you know, for decades, uh, trying to bring us a little closer to that understanding of ourselves. I know we've been chatting for, you know, for over an hour, so I don't want to like keep you too long. So I do want to thank you for, for, uh, you know, taking the time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to chat with me today because I think people, uh, you know, I know I have learned a lot. And I mean, when it comes to being on the forefront of what I like to call just like this incredible stuff, I mean, whether it's Paralab and now it's the uh, GCP, I mean, you're one of these people that's out there that are an inspiration to other people. And I think for other people that go into science and to, you know, the real critical thinking aspect of this, I mean, I mean, even myself as a comedian, I'm like totally, uh, you know, in awe of the work you've done. So, you know, there's other people out there who are going to, uh, who already have been inspired by it. So, so it's just like really great. Uh, is there anything you want to leave us with about like the future where you think it, you know, where you think it goes? Uh, you, just you personally. No. Yes. Okay. I'm, uh, I've been for, for a number of years now, talking about the technical and the stuff and the scientific results a, a bit, and then um, doing sort of segues one way or another into why, why it should matter and what people should take away from it. And what, I, what does matter is this, uh, what, something I've mentioned earlier. We are creative. We, uh, the, um, the mind uh, isn't constrained, and it, it, it's always possible for us to do something uh, intentionally 
uh, to move ourselves forward. And um, the thing that's probably straight out of the global consciousness of findings is that we can do that better if we work together. We can do that very well if we put together uh, uh, groups, friends, and then strangers, but people aligned with the purposes of uh, becoming really human beings. So I'm, I'm just in simply put, we can consciously evolve and we ought to be, uh, give our best energies to that. And by the way, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Ryan. And I hope everybody um, in your, your audience uh, takes it upon themselves to look at the edges of what we know. That's where the interesting stuff really is. Oh, no doubt. Indeed, indeed. Well, uh, this has been a real treat. Uh, thanks for, uh, you know, thanks for doing it. I really appreciate it. I'm going to plug the website uh, real quick. Uh, noahsphere.princeton.edu, I believe right. that's the website uh, that, uh, you know, we kind of talked about the brief history of uh, how that came to be. I mean, th that's how actually I reached out to you. I reached out to you through that website. But there's great stuff on that website. Uh, there's the search tool that we talked about. Um, and there's, uh, there's all kinds of great stuff on the website. You can kind of get lost in there and explore if you're interested in, in more of like the nuts and bolts and, and actually looking at the data that's been accumulated by the, uh, by the project. So it's, it's great stuff. And, uh, and so thanks again. And, you know, maybe sometime in the future, I'll, uh, convince you to, uh, you know, do another interview with me down the road about like the, the history and we'll focus maybe more on the pair lab stuff and the work you were doing there. But, but in the meantime, uh, thanks again, really appreciate it and look forward to, uh, to what you got coming out next. Thank you, Ryan. And have a great day. You do the same. Thanks doctor. Thank you for listening to another experience of me and paranormal you. Um, that was Dr. Roger Nelson of the Global Consciousness Project, formerly of the Pear Lab at Princeton University, which I am certain, I am certain was the inspiration. I'll have to, you know, it's probably on the Internet somewhere. I could probably look it up. I mean, because who knows? Maybe the, uh, maybe the lab at Duke, uh, maybe the Stanford, uh, maybe Stanford had some input. I mean, maybe it was, it. you know, so I, I, I will have to check on that. But um I would not be surprised at all if Pear Lab was the inspiration for the television show Fringe. I mean, as it was like a Northeastern Ivy League kind of school, I, if, if I remember correctly. I watched like the first season and a half or first two seasons of that show. Um, anyway, that was wonderful. Noah's Fear, N-O-O-S-P-H-E-R-E dot Princeton dot E-D-U. That's the website, Noah's Fear, N-O-O, Sphere dot princeton dot edu you can check out that stuff there's some great charts and graphs on there so you can kind of see uh in a different way like the effect of global consciousness on on these random number generators it's it's very fascinating i know we didn't get into like the nuts and bolts of that there's great talks on the internet uh there's at least one uh video presentation where you can see dr nelson explaining all of like doing a very technical detailed description of of the results and things like that i didn't really want to have that conversation because that information is out there already so i think it was fun to uh, talk to the man who's kind of at the heart of it. He's not the only person doing it, of course, like he said, but it was fun to, you know, glimpse into the brain of a scientific, of a scientific and a creative a man who wants to uh, raise awareness about global consciousness and the reality of, of how, of, of just what it is and, and how it's this very real thing. I think that was really cool. So thank you for listening as well. Um, me and ParanormalU.com, RyanSingerComedy.com, uh, Rising on Instagram, on Twitter, me and ParanormalU also on Instagram, 818-839-0593, that's the mind line, and Patreon.com backslash RyanSinger. That's how you can become a patron to the Mindcast, anywhere from a dollar to, uh, you know, up and beyond. There's all kinds of levels um, that get you different things. I know bonus segments for interviews go up uh, there at least a couple times a month. There will be no bonus um, for the talk we had today. You got all the talk from Dr. Nelson today. Um, I should have done a bonus. I should have like asked him some like real stuff. Like, you know, like, so what do you think? You know, uh, no, I did ask him real stuff. So, um, yeah. So thank you to the patrons. Um, 
for your continued support. Uh, so I uh, got some uh, ideas for things. I think I've got a, a list uh, since the Oscars just came out. I've been trying to compile my best paranormal uh, ish movies um, to watch uh, my li- my personal list of favorite documentaries and movies uh, that'll be going up over there as well as some other stuff. So um, thank you very much. And now that the, I have the Patreon app on my phone, I can start doing, um, you know, live video or I can do video snippets and things like that. Or just when I'm like, maybe on when I'm on investigations and things, I'll probably, if there's anything good, I still haven't gone through all the audio from my last paranormal investigation, but if there's anything good over there, I'm going to post it over on the Patreon page. Uh, any EV- EVPs uh, will be posted over there. So, yeah. So thank you very much again. I hope you're doing well. Remember one love, one consciousness. Uh, We can all do. I know I can do better. Oh, man. Uh, I can do a lot better. I can get out of my own head, um, you know, and uh, get out of my own body and try to remember the connectivity of it all. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I hope you're well. I hope you're enjoying the end of winter as we get ready to spring into spring. So, uh, yeah, I love you very much. I hope you love yourself. Uh, you deserve it. And if, uh, if I don't see you at a show in Los Angeles or out on the road somewhere, I hope to see you at the watering hole on the astral plane.